extensions of time, and I'm going to call Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, I thank the Senate, and I move that the Senate records its deep regret at the death on 30 August 2022 of Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev, the last leader of the Soviet Union, place on record its acknowledgement of his role in bringing the Cold War to an end and his vision for a more open and peaceful world, and tenders its profound sympathy to his family in their bereavement. President, it is with sadness and respect that I move this condolence motion on the passing of the former president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. As a child of the harsh Russian 1930s under Stalin, Gorbachev was a man of simple background. His father and grandfathers were farmers in the early years of Soviet agrarian collectivism. His family life was so harsh and brutal, he later reflected what difference was there between this life and serfdom. This early question reflected a lifelong courage to see clearly and to ask difficult questions. Nevertheless, he did not start his career as a disruptor. He was a party man and a loyal Soviet citizen. He was a brilliant student studying law at Moscow State University. While he was there, he met his wife, Raisa Titarenko, and they married in September 1953 and shared a close emotional and intellectual partnership which endured until her death in 1999. After graduation, he returned to his native Stavropol and his promise was quickly recognised and he rose through the ranks. In 1978, Gorbachev moved back to Moscow to take the position of Central Committee Secretary. Then in 1985, he took leadership as General Secretary. His three immediate predecessors had all died in office within the preceding four years. The Soviet ruling class was ageing, and it had failed to confront the growing reality of economic mismanagement and an arms race of the United States that the Soviet Union could no longer afford. Gorbachev, by contrast, was a relatively young man in his 50s, and more importantly, he recognised that the Soviet Union was not serving its citizens and needed to change. Throughout his leadership, Mikhail Gorbachev was the, the defining figure in opening up Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Glasnost, perestroika, Mikhail Gorbachev became synonymous with the processes of reform, openness, transparency and reconstruction he drove and inspired across Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And at a time that mutually assured destruction was accepted strategic doctrine, Mr Gorbachev had the courage to reject this nightmare and work towards nuclear arms reduction, earning for himself deservedly the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. From Stalin onwards, the Soviet Union had been built on brutal, unforgiving power, on repression, on force, on lies and on the denial of individual liberty, all sacrificed in pursuit of the ends of the state. Ultimately, it was a fragile and crumbling edifice which did not withstand the scrutiny and transparency brought by the Glasnost reforms. When the first people power revolution swept from East Germany out towards the rest of the Soviet bloc, the Soviet Union began to fall apart, crippled in part by its legacy of corrupt economic management and by the lies it had told its citizens. At that juncture, President Gorbachev made the critical decision and one utterly unpredicted by any glance through Russian history to let power go. There are those, including the current Russian president, who see this decision as a moment of weakness, but it was an act of profound courage, an act of profound strength. Today, as we witness the weakness and insecurity that underlies Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, we can see just how extraordinary President Gorbachev's choices were. Our challenge then and now is to strive for progress and peace. Our challenge is to reject the logic that seeks to force one nation's will over another. 
instead to resolve our differences and to grapple with complex global issues like climate change, strategic competition, post-COVID economic recovery and all of the above and more, and to do so peacefully through dialogue, negotiation, compromise, hard work and respect, through openness and accountability to our citizens for the world we are seeking to create in their name. In the end, that is the lesson we can take from the life of Mikhail Gorbachev. In the end, we always have a cho choice about how we approach the issues we face and what we do with the moments with which we are presented. On behalf of the Australian Government, I wish to place on record my respect for this extraordinary life and career. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, I rise in support of the motion moved by the Leader of the Government in the Senate and to associate the coalition parties with the words and sentiments expressed by the Leader of the Government in the Senate. There can be no doubt that Mikhail Gorbachev was one of the towering figures of his era and one of the most significant world leaders of the 20th century. The importance of his role in bringing to an end the Cold War, which had cast a shadow over the world for half a century, cannot be understated. As one editorial opined, on assuming leadership, Mikhail Gorbachev assiduously turned his attention to one Herculean chore, dismantling the machinery of repression that his predecessors had so proudly and methodically erected. Mikhail Gorbachev was the first leader from the East able to work with leaders of the West after what had been decades of distrust and military threat. The fact that Mr Gorbachev could work to overcome this history of distrust through his relationship with then US President Ronald Reagan and with other world leaders reflected his commitment to his people and their own hopes for a more positive future. It was his meeting with then UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in London in 1984, which prompted the then British leader to declare of Mr Gorbachev that, I like Mr Gorbachev, we can do business together. That marked the beginning of the West's recognition of Mikhail Gorbachev as a new brand of Kremlin leader, a leader with whom the West did indeed do business, and meaningful business at that. In what many have described as a breathtaking series of reforms, Mr Gorbachev lifted the Iron Curtain that had drawn a line between the East and the West, freeing a continent from totalitarian rule. He secured agreement on disarmament treaties, notably nuclear disarmament with Cold War enemies. He freed political prisoners and allowed exiles to return home. He allowed his people, for the first time, to hear foreign news when he ordered an end to the jamming of foreign radio broadcast frequencies. He liberalised the arts and swept away decades of ideological restraint. And it was Mikhail Gorbachev who introduced free elections. Just consider how foreign that concept was to the people across the USSR at the time he did so. It were these very reforms that would ultimately give states in Eastern Europe the impetus in the years that followed to break free of Moscow. Mr Gorbachev will, to the world outside of the old USSR, be remembered as a reformer who brought greater openness to his country through policies the names of which are intrinsically linked to the man, a new era of openness through Glasnost and of economic restructuring through Perestroika. As Mr Gorbachev himself said in 1988 of his reforms, the winds of the Cold War are being replaced by the winds of hope. For indeed they were. For his work, especially in the reunification of Germany and the pursuit of nuclear disarmament, Mikhail Gorbachev was rightly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. His reforms became household terms and brought an awareness across the globe to the history of the states of the USSR and to the repression of generations. People across the former Soviet, former Soviet states seized the opportunity to reclaim their own nationhood, reflective of their own independent histories, languages and cultures. 
Thanks to Mikhail Gorbachev, they were able to do so without fear of military retribution. Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians leading the way to an independence that ultimately all 15 former Soviet states would seize. The relatively peaceful dismantling of the USSR and the relatively successful development of a number of the former Soviet states stand as a powerful legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev. However, in the end, not all of his reforms have been enduring. Many were more popular outside of his own country than they were within. Despite that, Mr Gorbachev's commitment to his people and to those across former Soviet states was never diminished. Nor had his relationship with the world leaders and champions of democracy who were able to work with Mr Gorbachev towards peace in a part of the world to which the concept had become alien cast aside. The failure of a bid for Russian president in 1996 did not dampen his commitment to causes he held dear. He continued his global work, including a focus on environmental causes. For anyone who was witness to the Gorbachev era, the strength of his relationship with his wife, Rosa, was abundantly clear, as was the extent of his grief at her death from leukaemia back in 1999. It has to be said, as we in the Australian Senate today pay tribute to a reformist leader, just how stark Mikhail Gorbachev's vision of the USSR contrasts to what we see today in Russia, both domestically and through its unlawful invasion of Ukraine. Mikhail Gorbachev died just days after Ukraine's 31st Independence Day, and sadly, also days after the six-month anniversary of Russia's attempted full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In the days following the death of Mr Gorbachev, it was reported that he was dismayed by the new area of Russian authoritarianism, of military aggression, and the overturning of media, religious and other freedoms that he had helped deliver for the Russian people. Having fought so hard to bring glasnost to the Russian people and those across the old USSR, it must have been particularly devastating to see Russia positioned now as being at least, if not even more, distrusted, isolated and seen as a disruptor on the world stage than it was before Mikhail Gorbachev's reign as its leader. While it is a sad reflection that these current events make Mr Gorbachev's work towards peace in Eastern Europe and across the globe seem even more elusive, we should not forget his achievements. The peaceful establishment of many nations, the reduction of many nuclear warheads, and a significant period of greater peace, stability and openness are legacies that Mikhail Gorbachev should be remembered for. And while not all hopes from 30 years ago have been realised, it is these challenges which remain that makes it more important than ever that we honour the life and contribution of the reformist Mikhail Gorbachev, and that we all continue to strive for the peace that he worked for. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. The Australian Greens join in expressing our condolence for the death of former President Mikhail Gorbachev. Mr Gorbachev worked to cultivate constructive relationships with international counterparts to address the nuclear brinkmanship and reduce the political and military tensions at the heart of the Cold War. His approach stands in stark contrast to the warmongering we see from some current leaders, beating the drums of war with little regard for the human toll. In particular, Mr Gorbachev's work on nuclear weapons should be commended. At the Reykjavik summit in 1986, he championed an agreement led by the US and the Soviet Union to dismantle their nuclear weapons and undertake sweeping reforms of nuclear arms control. If this had succeeded, the world would have had a great opportunity to create a world free of nuclear weapons. Instead, we are still facing nuclear armed states. The Reykjavik summit was a watershed moment and the first time that the US and the Soviet Union discussed international issues with diplomacy and a real desire for improvement. Reflection on Mr Gorbachev's legacy is a moment to reflect that nuclear disarmament is within reach as long as political leaders have the courage to make tough decisions. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. And I rise to associate the National Party 
um, with this condolence motion and the comments made to the chamber today. It's difficult for anyone born post the 1980s to comprehend what the world was like pre the collapse of the Soviet Union or to convey to those who did not live through the Cold War era just how awful it was. This was a world that lived for decades on the edge of a nuclear holocaust, a world threatened by an empire propped up by twin methodologies of terror and lies, by KBG agents and armies of informers whose task it was to crush all opposition to the official party line. It was deeply contradictory and a troubled political system. The Soviet Union was responsible for the hyper-acceleration of an unhinged international arms race, and yet it could not provide even the basic provisions for its citizens on its supermarket shelves. Perhaps it was inevitable that such a system would eventually collapse. Yet history shows, however, that one man almost single-handedly precipitated that collapse, Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev came to power in 1985, and he was 53 years of age. This was decades younger than most of his comrades in the Politburo, and a very stark contrast to his octogenarian predecessors. Gorbachev was the eighth and last leader of the Soviet Union, successor to Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, Tonenko. So young was Gorbachev that in the 1980s he was given global rock star status. Gorbachev was the leader for six short years until 1991. As General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev embarked on a remarkable program of reform that was based on two extraordinary ideas, perestroika, the restructuring of the political and economic system, and glasnost, the end of censorship and the introduction of free speech. Gorbachev was an adherent to Marx's Leninism, but during his leadership moved the Soviet Union towards social democracy. His achievements included withdrawal from the war in Afghanistan, liberating the Soviet satellite states in East Central Europe that included the unification of Germany and reducing nuclear arms. As one obituary writer in the New York Times stated last week, few leaders in the 20th century, indeed any century, have had such a profound effect on their time. And in little more than six tumultuous years, Mr Gorbachev lifted the Iron Curtain, decisively altering the political climate of the world. At home, he promised and delivered greater openness as he set out to restructure his country's society and faltering economy. It was not his intention to liquidate the Soviet Empire, but within five years of coming to power, he presided over the dissolution of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. As history shows, the economic reforms Gorbachev set in place proved to be greatly flawed. Perestroika proved a catastrophe and became synonymous for chaos, corruption and dislocation that accompanied the country's turbulent transition to a market economy in the 1990s. Privatisation resulted in vast state assets being taken over by uh, Russian oligarchs, many of whom still control them today, while a devastating earthquake in Armenia uh, the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, combined with, ironically, a deep fall in the price of oil, impoverished the country and sunk Gorbachev's popularity. Gorbachev's time of triumph was short-lived. In 1990, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in recognition of his outstanding services as a reformer and who greatly contributed change for the better nature of the world development. In 1991, a referendum confirming the breakup of nations that made up the Soviet Empire was approved by more than three quarters of those who voted. But a few months later, a coup was launched against him. And during the standoff, Gorbachev was forced to step down and Boris Yeltsin took power. This um, outcome was first uh, alluded to uh, by our own Paul Kelly in The Australian in 1987, commenting uh, on Bob Hawke, the then Prime Minister's visit um, to Russia during this time, where he said, in short, Mr Gorbachev has greater obstacles. First, he faces political reactionaries, with a majority of the Politburo being appointees by his predecessors, and secondly, he faces the dead weight of the Soviet bureaucracy, which only knows Soviet central planning. The great irony of the passing of Gorbachev last week, age 91, is that uh, he is despised by many Russians today. As several commentators have noted, it would be hard today to find a Russian who remembers him positively, much less the brave and heroic way he is perceived in the West. Many Russians, like Vladimir Putin, long for a lost empire and believe Gorbachev was the person who destroyed the might of the Soviet state. In fact, Putin has described Gorbachev era as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. 
To Russian liberals, on the other hand, Gorbachev was the leader who failed to set its successor in the right direction. When he visited Australia in 2006, Gorbachev said in an interview, when I was in office, I never regarded Australia as just a satellite of the US. Of course, the policies of the Australian government could give that impression, but we regarded Australia as an important country, as a wealthy country, as a country with which we wanted to have a better relationship, and that is still my opinion. While the Soviet Empire is no more, some of the more abominable aspects of that regime have re-emerged in recent years. Indeed, while entire empires can fall, dangerous and destructive ideologies have a habit of re-emerging. The invasion of the Ukraine is, in part, an attempt to reverse the loss of status felt in post-Cold War Russia by the disintegration of the Soviet Union that occurred under Gorbachev. And in the West, including in Australia, we're experiencing neo-Marxist novelties re-emerging in the form of challenges to personal and national freedoms, challenges to the free expression of ideas and opinions, threats to true academic freedom, freedom of religion, and to the right to practice your faith and bring your children up in that faith. We on this side of parliament, and I hope across parliament, especially in the nationals, adhere to certain invaluable values of freedom, respect, fairness, equality of opportunity and private property for rights. Mikhail Gorbachev was the last of the great leaders of the last century, and as such we honour his contribution, known as the great facilitator to a more peaceful, secure world, as well as to individual freedom. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. Thank you, senators. <coughs>